Um, Zoe Davy is a senior lecturer at the Montfort University in the School of Applied Social Sciences. Uh, she's got a PhD in Gender Studies from Leeds University. Uh, she's perhaps one of the most um, um, well-known speakers from the UK at the Centre for Social Studies because we've been lucky, <laughs> we've been lucky to have her uh, over and over again uh, um, lecturing at the PhD programme in Human Rights in Contemporary Societies but also uh, earlier on, a couple of months ago in May, when we organised the uh, summer school on, on monstrosity, the intimate summer school. Um, Zoe was also one of our invited speakers. So uh, she's also the author of a book which is still a reference, although it was published already eight years ago, called Recognize. Well, then you speak about it. Uh, then, well, people will Google. Um, called Recognizing Transsexuals. And we also use that uh, a lot amongst other publications from, from this year. And well. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to read my paper because I've just had some braces put in. And so I'm, I, I've not been able to practice it. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to read it. So if you can't hear me, and, and could just tell me because I might, because they're a bit painful at the moment. Okay. Um, so my talk's called Queer Research Assemblages and Epistemological Commitments. And I want to talk about um, our commitments to the research process and, and whether we can talk about um, uh, queer approaches and whether there's better um, um, applications um, of our power as researchers. Um, so a practical recognition that's required of researchers is to be able to choose the best form of methodology for the job at hand or for researchers to understand by choosing one methodology over another will inevitably produce different results. Today I want to draw on Fox and Aldred's recent paper by paraphrasing their understanding of doing and producing research to take this further and suggest that the choice of methodology amongst many other aspects will affect and thus produce different results. I think their concept of research machines as a part of a research assemblage allows us to begin to recognize research as a process of territorialization. And there's a, a, a short um, explanation of what that is. It's a Deleuzean, Deleuzean, Guattarian term. Research territorialization is the momentary settling of the researcher's constituent parts a research assemblage into mo a momentarily situated research machine, a whole that shapes the knowledge produced and in effect wider knowledge production. The knowledge that research produces manifests according to the particular flows of affect produced by any researcher's methodology, methods, analysis, writer, and all the people involved. So that this materialist analysis of research as assemblage is pivotal to my more recent understanding of research integrity and will form the basis for a critical framework for this talk around qualitative and indeed it's often uh, quoted nemesis, quantitative social inquiry surrounding trans and gender non-binary people. I'll further show that research territorializations that are implicated in all research production, as I understand them, has implications for claiming a queer methodological approach to research subjects. <coughs> queer methodological approaches within a deconstructive framework, I will suggest, is less productive and arguably less queer than has been claimed. If we take the queer approach as a queer reading of text in its widest sense, including research interviews, artefacts, perhaps even critiques of statistical analyses, queer theory builds, on, uh, builds upon feminist challenges to the idea that gender is part of the essential self 
and upon gay and lesbian studies, close examination of the socially constructed nature of sexual acts and identities. Where gay and lesbian studies focused its inquiries into natural and unnatural behaviour with respect to homosexual behaviour, queer theory expands its focus to encompass any kind of sexual activity or identity that falls into normative and or deviant categories. In effect, queer approaches tend to try to show the social constructiveness of genders and sexualities and deconstruct them out of existence or banish them as mere social constructions. Waiting to be replaced by more social constructions and so forth. As a caveat to this talk, deconstructionism as a research method has often been used in post-structural, postmodern, and queer trans studies and has been useful to dispel concepts and ideas about authentic transgender and sexuality, or showing how particular forms of power are implicated, particularly in the construction of a hierarchy of sexual and gendered beings in societies. However, it's been less successful at debating its own internal inconsistencies when claiming firstly that their participants are queer, or indeed that everything is just there to be negated as inauthentic, and that queer methodologies can negate these authentic claims. This is because logically they must deconstruct their own selves out of existence too, because you can't claim for one uh, to be inauthentic, but or, or those experiences to be inauthentic, but queer experiences are authentic. So you're in a, becoming in a circular um, fashion. So queer theory has to fix the normative other by stripping away the multiple contingent aspects to reveal a shell, a shell of sexual identity, a shell of life, a shell of law, um, um, and so on, or artifact, um, for their deconstruction to work. We can suggest, though, from this, deconstruction, deconstructionism as a method of understanding genders and sexualities often proceeds with a zealous commitment to the act of negating people, things, power, discourses over that of committing to the art of effective production of what Deleuze and Guattari call end sexes. Um, So N sexes, and it's like, you know, like the statistical N equals, yeah, N sexes, indicates that sexualities and genders are reconfigured in multiple ways, in an ongoing way, and are always queer. They are deterritorialized until through our research assemblage, people, things, texts, such as, um, and, and within its products, such as questionnaires, questions, observations, analytical frameworks, we territorialize them. As such, knowledge production and its products and are nevertheless full of desire, the researcher's desire. They are part of the desiring machine that creates affects, which ultimately territorializes things, people, discourse, power. <coughs> <clears throat> unqueering those things they wanted or indeed need to be queer for their analysis. Yeah. So by territorializing things, you're unqueering it because you're situating it into a thing and something recognizable. In effect, in Deleuzean terms, when something becomes determined or territorialized through the research process, it is no longer queer because we have suspended it momentarily in our research products. I would like you to consider the effects involved in administering a questionnaire. These act on the researcher and respondents, requiring a question to be asked, an answer to be displayed, uh, supplied, then answers to be recorded and possibly allocated to a pre-coded category. The instrument is 
um, then applied consecutively and independently to each respondent in turn, generating completed questionnaires with marked or unmarked data ready to be fed into an analysis machine. In this case, the research, research machine acts as a filter, often a screen of the labour effect on uh, the um, <coughs> Uh, and the effect of others on the researchers, such as the ethics committee, which kind of fits into all these kind of other aspects that um, was talked about before. The serendipity <coughs> of accessing the sample, and of course the respondents themselves, the moods or states of mind they, they're in at that particular moment in time when they're responding to the question that the researcher is asking. These are all affected properties that feed into this territorialization and then own queers, what is meant to queer. Similarly, <coughs> the thematic qualitative data analysis in its simplest manifestation is a machine that manually or via software organizes and reduces non-numerical data, making it more manageable and amenable to systematic reporting and so on and so forth, creating conceptual schema. Thus imposing an analyst-defined aggregation, this is where the researcher's desire comes in, upon the disparate data from the research event. This also happens inductively from the data, but often in these instances, inductive claims assume that we as researchers are unaffected by, or indeed do not affect, the research assembly. As Biddy Martin asserts, it seems crucial then to sustain a non-sensorious curiosity about the complex relations between power and trans and sexuality. Um, I've inserted trans there. Um, even as we open up the space for curiosity and honest exploration of fantasies, desires and practices in the field of representation. There is no disclosure without concomitant closures, erasures, and silences. We can ask, as Martin does, what's get, what gets secluded, even as the supposedly repressed or disallowed enjoys a new celebration, the queer celebration. Yeah. What are we stopping? Um, is that queer? Although Biddy Martin is talking about sexuality, our insights can be applied to many research contexts. Martin is critical of, it, of, in this case, the choices made um, by a queer art group um, who decided to represent new forms of queer art while reifying it as queer art. The desire of the artist, the gallerist, the assistant, the marketeer, and all the other people involved in territorialising the work is obfuscated in its production. <coughs> Through the claims, that the artwork was queer art, the desire and ultimate power inherent in being able to name it queer art is, and in effect, closing down both historical art as ever being queer and any future art as being queer. As Jose Esteban Munoz observes, we can understand queerness then, or we should understand queerness itself as being filled with the intention to be lost and not found, yeah? So the queer art collective have found this queer art, you know? Whereas uh, Monos says, no, we need to be lost. We cannot represent that as queer art because you're closing town and silencing other aspects. If we apply this to trans and non-binary people in their multiple forms, we could argue that to represent trans and non-binary as two singular, shell-like manifestations of phenomena may also enact closures and erasures and silence some voices. <coughs> the limitations of a singular transgender, transsexual or non-binary identity is a conceptual impossibility, would also essentialize what it means to be recognized which will inevitably bestow recognition on some and not on others. 
As such, in this talk, I'd also like to explore the idea that all research carries epistemological commitments, which are beliefs about the nature of knowledge and the processes of knowing, and what Fox and Aldred call the affectivities of the research assembly, affected by the research machine, which I just talked about. The epistemological commitment section of the paper later, I hope, will clarify some points that I need I think need to be made clear in the researchers' approach before embarking on and during their field work, whilst analysing data and during the writing process. I don't I've only got a few epistemological commitments that I can kind of go through today, but you know, we can have a chat about any others. Um, <coughs> Um, but some of the questions that I feel need answering prior to embarking on during and post projects around the trans and non binary people, and I hope to do this um, by critiquing previous sexological, psychiatric, and deconstructive and some trans studies work. So, just take as an example psychiatric understanding that trans and more recently non binary people has conflated the body and gender and is pervasive in the way that trans people are depicted in medical terms. So numerous um, papers and healthcare policies and so on and so forth. Um, trans people are expected to live their lives in order to um, uh, get what they need um, uh, to transition or not, as the case may be, a particular narrative uh, within the clinic. Yeah. Um, but some previous work, um, myself and Eliza Steinbock um, did, um, we, we kind of suggested that some tra trans people understand to disclose their, um, for example, enjoying their penis or their vagina alone or with another while claiming a feminine or masculine identity um, is kind of considered dysfunctional by some of uh, pretty much all gender clinic psychiatrists. And many trans people often feel that if they admit to this, that this could lead to exclusion from any form of treatment. As such, trans people are reluctant to relay anything other than the standard narrative to the psychiatric teams. This um, analysis has implications of the relevance of the d data derived in gender clinics case study samples on the APA's well website, for example. Um, um, and what I'm trying to suggest that, that so, so um, the psychiatric and the clinical staff have particular research assemblages um, that they do, but it will turn out to be a circular <coughs> argument, you know, um, and I'll, I'll show why. So, um, and what I call kind of data circles. So the analysis has implications for the data derived in the gender clinics. So on the American Psychiatric Association's webpage, the DSM-5 development, the authors noted prior to the, um, the new diagnosis in the DSM, from 2007 to 2012, the work groups met regularly in person and they reviewed all the data um, to develop the new diagnosis. And, um, but they, they, their research machine only considered a number of um, um, research, uh, researches and things. And often the, these were clinical samples. Um, and so um, the literature reviews and systematic analyses of exi existing data can often um, uh, bring into a particular focus. In this case, however, the scientific literature that was included to form the new gender di diagnosis relied heavily on a select group of sexologists who were generally supportive of each other's work. <coughs> we know this if we access their bibliographies and analyse the incessant referencing of each other's work and the similar lines of argument. Much of the work that has been used in the DSM-5 pre-publication reports, which has clearly influenced the construction of the gender, uh, gender dysphoria diagnosis, has li um, um, has linked uh, gender identity disorder before 
uh, to either a previous homosexual orientation or a sexualized cross dressing fetish. Mm -hmm. And this has kind of ended up into two subtypes of sexuality that trans, uh, trans people who identify within a binary system as either autogynophiles or homosexual transsexuals. And now Anne Lawrence, a promoter of these theories surrounding autogynophilia and homosexual transsexuals, um, uh, was also included in this research assemblage um, to promote this uh, diagnosis. Um, however, contrary to all this, um, Julia Serrano's work argues that many people do not doubt the existence of these forms of sexuality. Um, but it's very much the same as any cisgendered sexuality. We fantasize out about ourselves, our own sexes, who we are, you know, whether within a, a, a gender <coughs> system, uh, like a, a male or a female. A man fantasizes about having sex as a man, and so on and so forth. So Rano's analysis um, uh, is important given the status given to the case study research in the in the sexological work. But because Lawrence's work was included and Serrano's review was not included in the research assemblage, the effective properties of her critique were not affected. The epistemological commitments here are obvious, yeah? And I think we need to do it ourselves. Who are we including in our work and who are we not including in our work in order to kind of push our epistemological commitments to, in certain ways, is that, is that are we getting to the essence of our participants in this way, or are we guided by this epistemological commitment to that conceptual framework of queer, or whatever that might be? Yeah? Um, I, I think that's kind of something that we need to think about. Um, And why I suggest this is because um, when analyses are formed um, within the, this very binary way, it kind of um, um, undermines the complexity of all our lived experiences in, in many ways. However, a materialist um, analysis of research as assemblage would insist on the limitations of these abnormal, normal epistemological commitments as a way of evaluating research integrity. Um, so the use of the studies of sample participants from gender clinics um, and some of the other scientific research used in <coughs> a systematic review to establish the new gender dysphoria dys diagnosis for both trans and non-binary people should have acknowledged that their cohorts have different affectivities than perhaps those participants found beyond gender transitioning programs. Do you see my argument? Yeah, it's about, it's about being honest with our um, uh, epistemological. Now, if we do that in relation to, I'm going to move on to how long I've got. You've got 20 minutes. Oh, another 20, okay. So I'm going to... Um, so we can also this see this circularity in other disciplines, um, particularly around psychobiology, neurobiology, even though in neurobiology um, they stress non-linearity, contingency and open-endedness about the body and the brain functionality. Once a conceptual framework is imposed on it, then all that non-linearity and, and the contingency of what constitutes a man and a woman becomes lost, yeah, and so, um, and, and so that's another kind of area that we need to kind of challenging or understanding the commitments that they're, they're using in relation to, for example, sex dimorphism. Um, Lindstedt and Pullen argue that the social meaning have already been assigned to biological features that far exceed anything warranted by biology. Therefore, gender and gender traits always remain in excess of the scientific variables being used. 
In the studies that I've kind of reviewed for this paper, the doing and judging of gendered behaviour ultimately confirms masculinity and femininity within the studies in a circular fashion. For instance, sexual behaviours such as mounting, the, uh, they use lots of rats and, and mice in the studies. <coughs> and they watch like the mounting, you know, like a bit like a dog, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, or whether they're submissive, and they regard that as masculine or feminine behaviour. And there's some, there's, uh, some people in, in London as well who, who showed some pictures of um, a monkey up a tree. Um, one was given a truck, like a toy truck, and it was going like this, obviously, you know, because they're kind of quite intelligent animals, aren't they? <laughs> Look at the masculinity he's demonstrating here. And then one was given a doll, yeah, and, and it was going like that, I and mean, it was pulling the legs apart. Look how caring she is. <laughs> I was like, what? So they've already imposed these kind of circular arguments on their data. Um, why I've kind of gone around that way is because I think you do also do that very much. So, um, okay. So, um, Deleuze and Guattari emphasise then. Um, that there's a multiplicity of molecular combinations bringing into play not only the man in the woman and the woman in the man, but the, the relation to a thousand tiny sexes. Therefore, these sex dimorphic assumptions upon which gender and ultimately gender dysphoria is based problematically leaves many theoretical arguments going around in circles. Reach research on binary sex difference has often, to, often stalled on the difficult questions of how and where these sex differences manifest, or the largely intractable question in humans of the origin of such differences. It is no small task to establish where sex differences come from within humans because controlled experiments are impossible, and thus conclusions can only ever rely on quasi-experiments, which are really easily contestable through a sexual critique. As Fujimura argues, within the shared terrain, many differences emerge, both within and between the scientific and social literatures, on the question of how to theorize the social in the scientific and about the scientific in the social, and how to create a language that does not separate science from society. We are all born into a world in which we embody scientific and social features. We often become, in what Merleau Ponty calls, habit. Any interpretation that considers the invariant core and the perspective of inherent behaviours is already pregnant with social meaning and obscures an organic relationship between the person and their world. So within this brief foray into sexological, psychiatric and biological, um, theorising about trans people, there are a number of effectivities upon which evidence is constructed. Broadly, the so-called scientific paradigms research assemblage is made up of a number of component parts that connect through lines of effect that will territorialise trans and non-binary people <coughs> at certain times into certain forms. The requirement of binary models of normal and abnormal men, women, science, culture power and subjection, alongside a facilitating researcher and research participants, may create an assemblage that contributes to the representation of trans and non-binary people as ontological entities, but they do not move, change or become. So what's all this got to do with my critique of queer approaches? <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to look. So you, you need to kind of think that laterally and then I'll bring it together. Yeah. As I said, 
post-structuralist, post-modernist and queer theory scholars a faith of research questions about how social structures through establishing hetero and gender normative registers of recognition work against genders, uh, queer genders and sexualities. The questions that tend to be posed in queer studies often elide questions about how and why changes to bodies, genders and <coughs> happen in society. Deconstructionism, as I've said before, as a method, has often been used in many of these approaches and um, being useful as I said before but in spite of this usefulness um, of these kind of politico-scholarly activities of undoing the gender and sexuality canon they often leave us with no place to go in Deleuze or Guattari in terms it generates very few productive lines of flight <coughs> So Brian Massoumi's English translation of uh, Ligne de Fouy in A Thousand Plateaus, he's kind of translated it as lines of flight, but it can also mean the act of fleeing. The act of fleeing, eluding, flowing, leaking, disappearing into the being lost into the distance. Transsexual bodies productively flee, elude, elude, flow, leak and disappear from the performative registers such as legal statutes and medical protocols that categorise binary and non-binary genders and its associated hetero and sexuality. <coughs> However, queer researchers rarely pursue analyses that ex explore transsexual practices that do these fleeing and eluding, um, preferring instead to represent trans practices as fixed, stable and normative in order, um, and, and I would argue shell-like, rather than analysing humans as co-productive forces of effect, as in Foucault's methodology in Discipline and Punish. The method of deconstruction pursued often opposes new identities, transgender, genderqueer, and non-binary, that are still shell-like against previously acknowledged binary genders and sexualities, mm -hmm. the transsexual, but yeah. Mm -hmm. um, um, which is often suggestive of one being more authentic than the other. For example, scholars such as Finn and Dell, although they were psychologists rather than trans study um, people, um, show that the instability of transsexual claims of womanhood or manhood by illustrating the volatility of the binary sex system, all very well. You know, that transsexuality is evidently constructed within. In these analytical moves, the new gender queers, uh, that, uh, are characterised as constructing <coughs> resistances to the subjugating bodily regimes that have, at the same time, formed the transsexual. Yeah. Um, we can, um, through this logic of negation, these analytical moves must, however, necessarily deconstruct gender queers out of existence too, because they rely on a fixed gender and sexuality oppositions upon which their gender queer relies. You know, because without a thing, you can, without something, you can't then claim a, a, a gender queer position. You have to have something in place. And so this, what I'm suggesting, um, okay, um, is. We're just going round in circles in this sense. We're going, oh, well, you know, we're better than you um, because we're, we're, we're not controlled by ideology and things. You're controlled by the binary system ideology. But they don't actually tell us the voices of the trans people themselves. Yeah? And so in the last few minutes, I just want to give some... Um, um, Quotation where so, but this is uh, I've just picked a couple of research participants that kind of show 
that. Yeah, this this participant um, has had um, surgery. Uh, this <coughs> uh, a neo vagina. Blah blah blah. Yeah, and. So she said, I decided I was going to transition. Your body does really dictate what you can do and who you are, what can be done to you, how you live. Something as basic, well, it's not that basic, but as simple as sex reassignment surgery. SRS suddenly changes the way you experience the world, the way your thoughts refer to objects, receptacles, for instance. All the symbolism we have in Western society, poles and swords. It's funny to switch sides. It's quite strange. In Amy's account, her connectivities are multiple. Bodies, sexuality, symbolism, age, surgery and knowledge form non-determined, strange effects. These affects are territorializing, but not within a singular transsexual identity. Amy emphasised that she wanted to... Um, oh, that page is upside down. <laughs> 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 I don't know how that hurts getting me lost. <laughs> she wanted to fit into a community outside. I wanted to slot into the lesbian community rather than the trans community. Being lesbian in the long run seemed more important than being trans. Amy's effective relations intensifies with lesbian desire identity, illustrating multiple effects on her desires to undergo bodily interventions. There were many effective <coughs> possibilities for her including her stylistic expression. Talking about one of the photographs um, um, that we were kind of discussing photographs throughout um, the interview. She said, this is me, it's probably as feminine as I ever get. I think where I'm heading is, well, the hair will be longer, a few hair extensions, but on blah, 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 etc., etc. Yeah. Here, more effective intensities surrounding aesthetics seem important too, all of which bodies, surgeries, transsexual, sexuality, symbolism, age, knowledge, lesbian community, aesthetics, unsureness, connect while I was talking to her for my research. I, I chose to incorporate this into my paper using concepts and particular words, though. The publisher published the, the article following reviews, and changes all culminating in a research machine that affects something. We can suggest then that this represents not what transsexuals do or, or, what, or, um, or how transsexuals are, but this unity, this transsexual unity, this one person, and how it, um, all these affective properties fit into a person. Yeah. Similarly, um, okay. and this is a, a guy um, who said, it's swaying more towards it, body modification. And yes, I probably would, it's a huge decision because it's obviously for a lifetime. I suppose, is it about, is it wrong or right for me? Not for other people, but for me. Is it something I should fight against? Is this something that I should accept or should... I just learned to accept it. Well, I belong to this group, and there are a lot of people, so I've spoken to them. I think a lot of people find that there are a range of different ideas. Some people feel that they have to have every possible option before they will be happy. For me, if I do one thing, will that be fine for a little while? So, for Charles, his decision for body modification were not based on the pervasive idea that men and women must have a penis and vagina respectively, but what was presently right for him, with the knowledge that lines of flights were always multiple. Multiple intensities were key to participants' claims of self-understanding within the effective parameters of their material contingencies of sex and gendered bodies. Rather than essentializing intensities, Participants facilitate ontological desires within lived relations, secure treatment if so desired, and open up the lines of flight surrounding their embodiment because of different intensities. So, I suppose, uh, shall I finish? Okay, so just um, to kind of 
round that up. What I want to kind of suggest is that um, when when um, we're suggesting that um, this work is queer, but by pitting this binary understanding of those non or those normative people without actually understanding what that you know to me that shell like you know it, it doesn't account for I mean we talked years ago about the straight queer and things like that you know what is going on in in their material <coughs> lives in order to uh, to um, or queer theory often doesn't allow for that kind of materiality of the heterosexual for example the queer heterosexual often and things and they set up this dichotomy in order to deconstruct things out of existence which is hugely problematic and I think that we should um, start to think about Deleuzean uh, materialist understanding as a as in the notion of queer once we deterritorialize things with knowing that we will territorialize things in our research but that's our epistemological commitment mm. and we have to acknowledge that epistemological commitment as not being queer mm -hmm. I think I'll end there yeah. Thank you.